Turn with me to John, the Gospel according to John, chapter 20. John, chapter 20. You know, the Easter morning, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one event which has been recorded in all the four Gospels. But I choose to read from John's Gospel, chapter 20. Uh, the reason why I chose this, it's also, I've got a message from the heading of this chapter. You know, if you see in Matthew, Mark and Luke, the gospel, when they account it, the heading comes before that is, He is risen. But John puts the gospel here, the topic as empty tomb. He is not writing as He is risen. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, it says He is risen, but in John, it says the empty tomb. That's very, very important message of our faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is very, very important. The empty tomb is of very significance for us. As we sang the song today in the worship about the empty cross, the empty tomb. Because Jesus is not there physically. Let me read this few verses and then I will speak to you on this Easter message. John chapter 20 verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they had laid him. Peter therefore went out unto the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes were lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciples who came to the tomb first went in also and he saw and believed for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went again to their own homes. And then Mary uh, Magdalene and their account. Uh, verse uh, 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabbanai, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Amen. One of the things, as I told you, the foundation for our Christian faith is the empty tomb. If you really uh, look at the other religions uh, in the world, the religious leader or the founder of the religion, either it is um, a Muslim or a Buddhist or any other religion you can think of, all their graves are still there and their bodies are still there. What makes Christianity is very different is our tomb is empty. There is no physical body is there. Jesus has risen. He is not among the dead. As we started the service, I read the account from Luke. It says, He is not among the dead, 
he is a living one. So we have to understand that he is among the living, not among the dead. So the empty tomb is very, very important, a very vital for our faith. You know, one of the easiest way you can uh, tell others about a Christian faith is, you can visit, the tomb is empty. Whereas the other tombs is not empty. They have got bodies. But here, we have got an empty tomb. So it's very, very important as an Easter message, the first and the foremost is our tomb is empty. Because he is risen. Amen. Um, come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I may share about four or five points uh, for the why, uh, how, why and how it is very important as we Christians believe in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Okay. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's a very important passage. You know, you can go back and meditate upon it, but I will uh, share a few thoughts from that. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also received and in which you stand. The gospel, the good news is that Jesus came, he took your place so that you can be forgiven. That I have preached to you and in which you stand. Okay? By which also you are saved. If you hold fast, that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you first of all that which I also receive, that Christ died for our sins. Messiah do not die. The Messiah, the one who want, one who is going to save you, the mighty king, he can't die. Here, our Messiah who came, he died for our sins and that according to the scriptures. He is the Passover lamb for us and he died for you and me on the cross. According to the scriptures. The point one. In the old covenant, you will find that when you make a sin, you have to bring a sin offering to the temple and you have to give the sin offering in the temple. Then only your sins, the punishment for your sin is being postponed. But after Jesus has been tied, then the, the temple has been destroyed. From AD 70 onwards, there is even till Tate, there is nobody is giving any animal sacrifice. Even in the world. There are no more animal sacrifice because Jesus has died for once and, all, and for all. Hebrews chapter 10, 14 very clearly says, by one sacrifice he perfected it. That's it. One sacrifice. That's all. No more sacrifices required. It's not necessary that high priest has to come and kill the animal, take the blood year after year going to the holy of holy. No need for it. Because it has been perfected by Jesus by one offering. Today, nobody, none of the Jews or anyone goes to the temple with the sin offering. It's not there. It's no longer there. Because Jesus is our Passover lamb and he died according to the scriptures. So you and me, today we have come to God, we have come to God to be worshipped with Him, to be with Him. Why? Because our sin offering, the Christ, the Lamb of God, the Jesus Christ, has paid the price. Jesus died for my sins, your sins. That is according to the scriptures. Point two. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 
That's why we say our tomb is empty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't have anything. It's an empty tomb. Amen. He has rose again. Just for a moment, come with me to Matthew chapter 27. You, know, you will understand, you know, because um, some of them uh, may not uh, understand this very perfectly. In Matthew uh, 27, verse 62. This is, Jesus has been uh, crucified and after that, he has been buried in the tomb, Joseph of Arimathea, he has taken uh, the Jesus' body and they embalmed the body and then they kept it inside. Uh, verse 62, Matthew 27 verse 62, on the next day after Jesus has been buried, on the next day which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate saying, Sir, we remember why he was still alive how the deceiver said, after three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb may be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. So they were really worried. You know, even if there is no resurrection is going to happen, they may, you know, steal the body and then they will say, oh, he has risen again. So let's not that happen. You know, you send the people, you guard the tomb. That's what they were coming and discussing. Pilate said to them, you have a God. You have God. Okay. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. It's a big stone because when Mary Magdalene and the ladies, they went to, uh, you know, went to the tomb, they were worried how somebody will roll over the stone. We cannot roll over. So they put a big stone and also they put security, the guards around the tomb so that no one can roll over the stone. No one can take the stone away and somebody can go and take the body away. So it was well secured. But when the ladies went on the third day morning, on Sunday morning, early morning, they found the stone was rolled over and the body was not there. Where were the gods? The gods knew he is risen. In the Matthew itself, look at chapter 28 verse 11. This is after the resurrection, they go back to uh, the people, the uh, Pharisees and the high priest. Now while they were going, behold, some of the God came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things had happened. They have witnessed and they have come and they have told the chief priest, he is risen. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. They cook up on another story and giving money. Okay, you tell them, you know, they came and they took away the body and this is the money, you keep it. And if this has comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So if the governor asks, why did you sleep? You are supposed to be guarding, so you will be put to death if, they, if the, such a case comes. We will make a deal with the governor, so you are safe. Don't worry, you can tell the lie. So Jesus rose again according to the scriptures. Amen. He rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Now 1 Corinthians 15 verse 5. And that he has seen by Cephas, that is Simon Peter, and by the twelve, verse 6. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the, remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. What Paul is saying, that he rose again according to the scriptures on the third day. When he rose again, he appeared to Peter, and then to the other twelve disciples, and not only that, he appeared to another 500 people, of which majority of them still alive. 
till the day they are still alive. Of 500 people, they are still alive. Only few have fallen asleep, but rest of them are alive. Few have fallen asleep means few of them have died, but most of them are alive. That's what he says. After that, he was verse seven in First Corinthians fifteen seven. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also. Jesus appeared to him, to Peter also, Paul as well. Us by the born one out of due time. Okay. So what he is saying that the resurrection. is not a story it is a real jesus came and he appeared to them remember when he come to uh, john uh, you know thomas when he tells thomas said unless i put my finger into his nail mark i won't believe it he said thomas you can touch and you can put your finger into my this one then thomas immediately said my lord my god so uh, jesus was physically appeared to all these disciples and not only that he appeared to another 500 of them and most of them were away at that time they were living verse 12 first corinthians 15 12 now if christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead if there is no resurrection of the dead then christ is not risen if christ is not risen then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty so the foremost of your faith in the lord jesus your belief about god should be based on the risen lord jesus christ otherwise your faith is empty our preaching is empty you know what is that uh, makes a difference you know every week after week i take this book you know the bible and then i speak you come and hear and you go back what does it make a difference because this is a living word you have to understand this is about god who is living so when we speak the word you the word lives in you and you transform and your life transforms that is why you come here and we speak not that in you talk about an another story book nothing happens to you why because that's a dead work but this is a living lord jesus christ who is risen from the dead and that is why you are being changed you Hallelujah. are being transformed Hallelujah. so your faith should be the foundation of your faith should be that jesus was died according to the scriptures for my sins and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures this is your basis for your faith otherwise your faith is not void in look at verse 20 in first corinthians 15 20 but now christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep so jesus has become the first fruit from the dead that is why when you know mary magdalene and others went and looking for a jesus in the tomb and the angel said why are you looking at the one who is living among the dead he is not a dead one he is living so don't search for him in among the dead he is a living one so your faith first point is about a empty tomb second is your faith should rest upon his resurrection and that is got to be made in your life personally that is why before starting the service i asked every one of you what it means to easter means what does personally mean to you easter means your faith this is the 
way in which you can ground yourself in faith that Jesus died for me and he rose again. That is what Easter is. That is where my faith is based upon. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come to John. John 20. So one is empty tomb and second is that his resurrection is basis for our faith. That's how we are saved. So we know that there is a resurrection. And third, on the first day of the week, you know, one of the major things happened 2000 years before on the Easter day is we worship the Lord not on the Sabbath on the first day. He changed the history. Mm. Until Jesus was risen, we go and worship the Lord on the Sabbath, on the seventh day. Mm. But after his resurrection, we worship God on the first day. It's a big, huge change the way we approach God. You know, the, the Old Testament uh, in Genesis 2, you will find that God has uh, created six day. On the seventh day, he had rested. Sabbath means refraining from work or stop working. That's what Sabbath means. So, God rested and then he constituted a rest, a rest for your physical bodies and that's why, that's how they maintain the Sabbath. In Mark chapter 2 verse 28 and 29, Jesus says, I am the Lord of Sabbath. So, what happened? We worked on the last day, we stopped working. That was the Sabbath. But when Jesus came and when he appeared, it became the first day of the week. If you have studied the book of Hebrews, you will know in Hebrews chapter 4 and the book of Hebrews, uh, the first and second and the third chapter, it talks about how Jesus was son of God, how he came and he made better than the angels. And in chapter 3, he talks about how he was better than Moses. And then in chapter 4, it talks about the rest. That God is going to give you a rest. <coughs> in that rest, you are going to enter into his rest. Can you turn with me to Hebrew. I will read one verse. Hebrews chapter 4. And then he says through Moses, it did not happen. And then for one day he said, David also said, and then Joshua also said, it never happened. And then he makes this statement for verse 10. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 10 it says, For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his so we start our week from resting on the work what the Lord Jesus has done. We start our week, Sunday is the first day of the week. Some of you, you know we are so much used to working from Monday, so we all think Monday is the first day of the week. No. Sunday is the first day of the week. Saturday was the seventh day. So that's why there are a lot of people, they still think that they can start, they can worship on Saturday. But whereas, it's very clear, the scripture is very clear how Jesus has fulfilled every law. You know, Romans 10, 4 says, Christ is the end of the law for those who believe and he is the righteousness for us. So, Jesus has appeared to the disciples on the first day of the week. So, 
after that after his resurrection after that easter morning our worship is only on the first day of the week even the early church did that um you know i'll show you in acts chapter 20 Yeah, Acts twenty verse seven. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. When did they meet? On the first day, in First Corinthians sixteen two. It says. on the first day of the week let each one of you lay something aside storing us up as we may prosper that there is no collection when i come so the early church meet only on the first day and that is why we are also meeting on the first day of the week so what is the difference between rest doing your work and then resting and starting your week from the rest because you don't have to do anything to up, to get god's approval by just being with him is enough to enter into his rest because jesus has finished all the work on the cross when he said it is finished it is finished so you don't have to do anything you come you believe in him and you take up the cross and you come to him and you start from that rest we don't strive to get rest we start from the rest that god has done everything for me and i walk from that jesus has paid the price for me and i'm walking from that so your attitude changed from rest come you know doing your work and then coming and resting rather you start from rest and enjoy your life that is what jesus had done mm. on that easter day the history is completely changed mm. it's no longer sabbath it is the first day of the week you know not only here in a couple of other places where jesus was on the earth after his resurrection he appeared to his disciples four times and every time he appeared only first day of the week you can go back and study the scriptures it's very well mentioned okay and uh, verse 7 in john 20 verse 7 it says and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen clothes but folded together in a place by itself why it is so important yeah handkerchief or a, a part of a um, uh, cloth which is used in your eating in the middle eastern culture in your eating a cloth like this is being folded properly and kept in place is why is it such a significant the scripture mentions it it is he folded and kept it that means he is going to come back his meal is not finished his work is not completed he is going to come back hallelujah you know when you in the middle eastern culture they have got a, a kind of a easy chair they recline and then they eat the meal takes a long time they eat for a very longer time say about an hour or two so they make a roti or whatever it comes one after the other they you know they talk they chat with each other and then they eat and you know remember in even in the uh, jesus washing disciples feet and at that time jesus is talking and you know somebody one of you is going to betray and then immediately peter asked ask him who it is and then john at that time he was leaning on the 
Jesus bosom. So that means they were all reclining and they were talking and they were doing everything. So, while when somebody is uh, eating, if they are uh, having a meal together, they are eating together, the servant comes and they keep serving the food. If you are finished, if you finished eating, then they just put it like this. That means you, they no longer need any more food, it is enough, you can clear them. But while they are eating, they have got some other business to attend. Then what they do is, they fold their napkin, they fold it nicely and leave it on the side and then they go away. That means when the servant comes and he looks at it, then he knew the master is still not finished and he will come back again mm. to eat. So I should not clear his plate, he will come back and I have to serve him. That's a thing. So the, those days, those who were reading the Bible, they knew very well. Those who lived on that time, they knew the significance of the folded handkerchief. So what Jesus has done, and he went with other clothes, other clothes were not folded, but the handkerchief alone folded neatly and kept on the side and then he gone. Jesus is coming back again. Hallelujah. Jesus is going to come back again. Amen. He is going to come back again. Amen. That is what he told. I am coming back. I am not finished. And I am going to come back and I am going to take you back. I am going to take you where you are to be there. So I am going to take you. I'm, my second coming is there. That is why I am coming back. Hallelujah. So when the disciples saw it has been folded and kept, they knew exactly, oh, master is going to come back. Mm. Our master is not finished, he is going to come back. It's very important. So the Easter message is very clear that he is still not finished, his second coming is for sure. Amen. You know, one of the things, he has fulfilled so many prophecies. Only in the last day, the last 24 hours, yeah. he has fulfilled something like 137 prophecies. It is impossible, it is impossible for anyone to fulfill every possibilities. If you take a, on a numerical thing, it goes into billionth and billionth of chances for some one person to <coughs> fulfill so many prophecies. And he fulfilled them all in the last 24 hours. Every one of them. So if God can fulfill so many prophecies concerning his first coming, and there are numerous promises, prophecies for his second coming, he is surely going to come. Jesus is going to come. His second coming is for sure. That is why he folded the napkin and he left it and he went. And he is coming back. Hallelujah. The last point, the last count, fourth point or the fifth point, if you are taking notes, then you will know. Verse 17. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, and go to my brothers. Go to my brothers, and say to them, I am ascending to my father, and your father and to my God and your God. Hallelujah. Jesus, this is the first time telling his disciples, you are my brothers. In Matthew 12 you will read, when someone comes, when Jesus was teaching, some people will come and tell them that your mother and your brothers are there. He will say, who are my brothers? Who are my mother? Whoever hears my word and they do, they are my brothers and my mother. That's all he says. But here he says, the first time, go and tell my brothers. He addresses them, my brothers. 
that I am going to my father and your father. When he also taught his disciples to pray, he said, our father in heaven. He told them. But here specifically tells them, you go and tell them, I am going to my father and your father and my God. God. You know, Jesus addresses God as God on the cross while he was hanging on the cross. You know, he quotes the prop, you know, David quoted that a prophecy in Psalm 22 verse 1. He quotes it, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, you all know that in Greek also, Eli, Eli, Laba, Saba, Thani. You know, we all remember that alone, you know, that one Greek phrase we all don't know. We know, we also know a little bit of Greek, like, you know. So, he cries out on the cross that my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He has never addressed God as God before that. Never. He said always my father. He never addressed God as God until at that moment on the cross. Only on the cross he said my God, my God. You know why? Because until such time, we were addressing him as God, God. From that moment onwards, we can call him Father, Father. Hallelujah. Until such time, we were addressing him God because he was forsaken so that we may be accepted. So Jesus was rejected on the cross so that we can be accepted as his beloveds. And then Jesus says, go and tell my brothers. You know, God is telling you, you are my brother, you are my sister. Jesus is telling you, you are my brother, my sister. What a wonderful, amazing, comforting promise this could be. You can walk into God, Daddy, Abba, Father, you can walk into Him. What an amazing thing what has happened on the Easter day. That is what happened. When he when he resurrected, he said, you go and tell my brothers. I am so, so thrilled that it has happened 2000 years before. That I can go to God as my father. I don't have to go to him as God. I have an access to God as a father because what Jesus has done on the cross. He said, go and tell my brothers. And I am going to my father and your father. So now we are all born to different mothers but to one father you are all we are all born to different mothers to one father that is God hallelujah hallelujah that is what happened on the Easter day and he said my God and your God one of the comforting promise which you should remember is that Jesus lives as a man, mm. even now. He is a man representing us to God. He is sitting at the right hand of God. He is not sitting there as God. He is sitting there as a man. In 1 John 4, 17 it says, As he is, so we are in this world. And 1 Timothy 2.15 says, There is one God, one mediator, that is the man Jesus Christ. Amen. He is a man. When he rose again, God raised him through the Holy Spirit. And he made him, he seated at the God's right hand side. So that he can sympathize with you. Whatever you are going through in your life, whatever the problem, whatever the difficulty you are going through in your life, he can sympathize with you. And we have an advocate with the Father. That's what 1 John 2 says. We have an advocate to represent us. Who is that advocate? Jesus is your advocate. And he is saying, go and tell my disciples, uh, go and tell my brothers. He doesn't call them as disciples. He tells them, my brothers. And he says, my father and your father. And my God and your God. That is why when the book of Ephesians talks about it, in Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about it. How we are all seated together with him. 
in Ephesians 2 verse 6 says, 6 and 7 says, that he raised us up together with him and seated with him in the heavenly places. In spiritually, though you are physically seated here, spiritually we are seated at the right hand of God along with Christ. Amen. That is what happened on that Easter day. 2000 years before, God did an amazing thing. As you know, on, on the time he was crucified, when he said, it is finished, the temple curtain torn from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Not from bottom to top. Bottom, top to bottom. The God tear open the curtains. There is no more distance between you and me. And I want to dwell with you. I want to be with you. There is no longer that, you know, there is a distance between you and God. God lives inside each and every one of us. As we were talking about, you know, the Easter, Roy was the one who was sharing that, you know, the Holy Spirit, Jesus lives through us in, in the Holy Spirit. He is in us, the Holy Spirit in us. So when we come together, when we come together, that opportunity for the Holy Spirit to come and God to live in us is because of what has happened on 2000 years before on the cross. Amen. And Jesus, when he rose again, when he said, you go tell my brothers. I don't know how excited you are. Whenever I read this passage, I get really excited. You know, Jesus is saying that I am his brother. And he is saying, I am going to my father. What a wonderful father we have. What a wonderful God we have. So this is an absolutely amazing thing happen on the Easter day. Amen. First and foremost, the tomb is empty. Okay? So we worship a God who is living. Mm. Say it with me. Empty tomb, empty tomb. And we worship a living God. And second, He is a risen God. You know? He died and He rose again according to the scripture. Because he is risen, our faith is based on him. Second point is, he is risen, so my faith is valid. And third, he is going to come again. He is going to come again. And he fulfilled the Sabbath, and we have entered into his rest, so we start in his rest. We start in his rest. And finally, he is our elder brother. He is the firstborn. He is our elder brother. So you know the way how the elder brother takes care of the younger brother. So the younger brothers can testify, you know, how well the elder brothers take care of them. Sometimes you may not like it, you know. Some of the elder brothers may not take care of you very well. But we have got a very good elder brother, Jesus Christ, Amen. who takes care of us and who has made a provision for us. And he is no longer he is a God. He is as your father. That's a wonderful, wonderful promise. I don't know, God, whatever you remember or not, one thing you remember, he is your father. Amen. And 2,000 years before, as he rose again, you know, he has opened the way. So we can go to him. Abba, Father, Daddy. You can knock on him and you can tell him whatever you want. And you can have a communication with him. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God lives in us. And there is no difference between, you know, God and us. We, we have no gap between God and us. And we together live along with him. Mm. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing has happened 2,000 years before. So let's pray. Mm. 